Not that Snapdragon is the only one dealing with overblown yet under season dramatic turmoil. <laughs> What is it? N Nothing. In case your reaction is teetering somewhere around... Huh? What? How? Why? Allow me to confirm that what you just saw was 100% correct. Time just had a PTSD episode from seeing some rando old guy dressed as a tree. She got triggered by a guy dressed as a tree. Who wrote this? Which one of you was it? Who's the Muppet who thought this was acceptable? And which of you were the ones who didn't stop this from happening? Your understanding of trauma is so laughable, I don't think there exists an adjective insulting enough to describe the absolute brain farting. I wish to remind everyone that people actually got paid for this. Also, though I said there's no racism in this world, this whole thing is clear anti-end bigotry. They are proud and magnificent creatures, and they deserve the same rights and respect as everyone else. Just because they occasionally stomp on people, doesn't mean you have to get all jumpy around them. That's just rude. Also, also, while we are on the subject of costumes, what is the context of angels in this world? Are they a religious symbol? Or do they exist as a common race like all the rest? As a counterpart for the demon kin? And if that's the case, wouldn't this count as cultural appropriation? Also, 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 we later learn that mermaids do actually exist in this world. So that would make Snap's costume the fantasy equivalent of blackface, right? I'm just trying to understand the rules here. The writers are the ones advocating for all-inclusive let's not hurt anyone's fifi's anti-bigotry ultra-mindfulness. A bunch of ideologues tripping on their own rules. Go figure. Also, 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 the less said about Parsley's cross-species cosplay the better. Lots of... weird implications there. No, 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 it's good. It's good. I just want to be as close to you as possible. I just want to burrow into you like a love tick. I want us to be one person, two hearts inside one skin. <gasps> That's it. I'm going to cut off your skin and drape it all over my body. Anyway, time is feeling guilty for lollygagging and partying with the idiot brigade when there's woodlands to be saved. So, she decides to hit the road and return home with healing water in tow. Kinda makes one question how come she didn't depart earlier? Saving her home is her sole motivation to attend the academy. And she has had the healing water for a while now. However long it has been between the cave trip and the festival. So why has she been procrastinating this long? And for some reason, Despite vocally protesting her costume, I feel like damp roadkill. She doesn't change into her normal attire before heading off. In any case, before she can depart proper, time is stopped by the emergence of a familiar face. It's the return of the mutant Garfield. Oh my god! And in case you are wondering just how the hell Neppy is back with his grotesque buffness, the short and simple answer is. The writers are lazy morons. The slightly longer answer is... I must warn the girl ones! Nepi knows exactly which ingredients to use. The specific ingredients are just sitting there, ready to be knocked over. And the pot is apparently filled with liquid day and night? At this point, why even bother showing the process if you are so insistent in your refusal to have any of this make sense? 
Nepi warns Time about Olive, he spied on the villains having their staff meeting on the subject of let's kill everyone. The utterly incompetent baddies didn't notice the obvious orange cat gawking at them. Olive knows Nepi has been stalking the rot tree. She knows Nepi has a vested interest in purifying the rot. Has she not informed her superiors about these developments? Smokeface is right there, looking directly in the direction of Nepi. He should command Olive to snuff the kitty. Better not have any loose ends. But if anyone used their brains, then the plot wouldn't happen, so let's work with what we have. Nice costume. You had a bit too much milk there, fella. I know very few actual words. The kissing booth is that way if you're looking for girls, or guys, or cats. Look, I don't judge. Stop it. Get some help. Did you see the elf one? <laughs> I must tell the elf. <laughs> 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 Hey, Parnell, I think this lunatic overdid it on, on Aloe's special cookies. Why does this 14, 15, whatever teen year old know about Aloe's special cookies? At what context would this kid and this grown ass woman ever discuss special cookies? Does Aloe peddle drugs to minors? Because that would actually make too much sense for it not to be the case. To take extra cookies. Whoa! <laughs> Nappy cat? How did. Why are you here? The cat girl talked to a face of smoke. A cat girl? Nappy, how many of you are there? She is not a nappy. She is girl, but cat also. Well, that narrows it down. Cacophony. This is a word I know. So Nepi knows the word cacophony, but he can't come up with black dress and a collar to describe Olive. Whatever, I know, dialogue is hard. Let's just try to get through this. Time! We were worried. You guys, Nepi Cat is here. He came to warn us that some cat girl is after us because we know too much. Neppy Cat told you all this? And you believe him? Neppy knew about the healing waters. We need to find the cat girl before she finds us. Listen, I trust you. All of you. I know I've been, like, off. But I need you to trust me back, okay? Well, isn't that heartfelt and humble and honest and all that good stuff? Time is really warming up to the rest of the gang, isn't she? Friendship is magic. Keep this scene in mind. I'm not done with it yet. So the girls gather up, poised to find Olive, before she finds them. Which is the most idiotic thing they could possibly do, because you know, that beats the entire fucking point. The villain is after us, let's present ourselves to them. Did nobody honestly bother to think for a single solitary second what they were actually writing? Tell the teachers, this celebration is swarming with powerful veteran guardians. Inform the authorities that there is a terrorist running around with the stated goal of murdering children. Everyone at this festival is in danger. These four heroes are sickeningly irresponsible. So the unstoppable imbeciles meet the immovable dumb fuck. Olive has the force, and yet she somehow manages to lose in the end. Give it back! It's mine now. Anyway, enough chit chat. Please. It's the only hope I have to save my home. I don't care. Now, how about you all come with me, willingly? I'll introduce you to the triumvirate. We'll eat some cake, have a chat, and when we're done... I'll give you back the vial. We're not going anywhere with you! No? <laughs> no use clinging to false hope then. <gasps> no! No, 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 no! <sighs> Time. 
Honey, you know what this is? It's an unguarded pool of healing water. And what's this? Well, it's a hole in the mountainside, leading directly to the pool. And who's that next to you? Why, that's Sage, your classmate and confidant. And what's that Sage is holding? That is a Terra Sphere, a magical device that allows their wielder to perform a variety of miraculous acts. For example, they could fly you down the hole so that you can collect more healing water and then fly you back out safe and sound. Quit your melodramatic whining! You are crying over spilled milk! Just stop by the convenience store on the way back home, it takes a whopping minute! Think time, think! But no, after the day is eventually saved, time simply decides to sulk some more. No reason to go back home now, now that she no longer has the miracle remedy. Which means that once again, this subplot with the healing water was completely pointless. You could remove this element from the show, the entire cave spelunking misadventure, time planning to leave, the entire concept of healing water, and nothing about the main story would change. Even if we played along and accepted the show's narrative that all the healing water in the world is suddenly gone down the drain, it wouldn't change this plotline's place in the story. It's a red herring, a narrative deception by the authors. It's included so that the story seems more complex than it actually is. Time has to have something to motivate her, and this is the method the authors chose. Nothing is gained by the inclusion of this MacGuffin, bar the lame waterworks from time. It's pathetic artificial drama. A proper script does not have these kinds of narrative dead ends. Even in situations where the characters fail in their goals, whatever those may be, the aftermath of that failure should always tie into the next story beat in some way, so that the audience doesn't feel like the author is wasting their time. To be fair, the show tries to pull off something of the like in the following episode. We'll get to it. Suffice to say that the event itself is so unfathomably dumb and ends up circling back to nothing that it only feels like further waste of time. Point is, don't write plot lines that lead nowhere. Every story element should yield information vital to the main narrative, bolster the world building, or at the very least offer some character development. A fantastic example of this can be found during the first half of Fullmetal Alchemist. The Elric brothers are researching advanced alchemy in order to find out how to create a Philosopher's Stone so that they can fix their bodies and get their old lives back. They get their hands on these incredibly cryptic notes left behind by this one enigmatic master of alchemy. They toil day and night for weeks on end trying to decipher the secrets, and when they eventually crack the code and find the answer, they are slapped in the face with a horrifying truth. Without going into it too deep, they have essentially hit a dead end, they had their hopes set upon these files, and they yielded unsavory answers. The brothers failed, to put it plainly, they are back to square one, and yet, this research directly leads into further truths down the line, story developments, it links to certain central characters, and lays the basis for some of the most important ethics of this saga. The failure, in this case, feels like an organic part of the story, a single step forward in a larger journey, and a part of an intricate, beautifully weaved tapestry. It's neat. It's nice. It's a good story. You should read it. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon. As well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaya Vanderwatt, Six Stars, and Taugrin. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. 
Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.